you have your Bibles, uh, turn to James. Uh, on Wednesday night, our, our book of study is James. <clears throat> and in the third chapter, in fact, the book of James, James must have really been having trouble within his church, the church at Jerusalem, with the sins of the tongue. Because his book is, I've never known any writer speak more on any one specific area of, of personal sin on the tongue than James does. He talks about it in the first chapter, goes into 12 verses on it. In the third chapter, comes back. It, the only chapter he doesn't talk about the sin of the tongue, if I, if I recall right, is chapter 2. Otherwise, he... he so... <clears throat> So we've been doing a study on that <clears throat> on Wednesday night. I'm trying to find James right here. And we, we studied the first 12 verses, <clears throat> which is really interesting. The thing about James that he does, <clears throat> he presents a great picture of the problem and, and don't give you any solutions. <laughs> That's one of the problems the church has at large. <clears throat> they they can speak elegantly on the problem, but they have little information on the solution. And the solution is what we're after, isn't it? I mean, how do you fix it? <laughs> so, you know, you sit and you hear the problem. You go, I understand the problem. You understand the problem. How do we fix it? And the book of James, he talks a great deal about problems, and he lays them out really well. <clears throat> but he doesn't fix them. If you're, if you're not aware of how to fix them, then the book of James is just going to present a lot of issues without any solutions. And that's kind of an interesting way. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. But as a pastor, I know you've got to get at solutions. Because problems stay in existence, dead or whatever it is, unless you really uh, find a solution and a way to resolve it and, and, and commit yourself to that. So... In James, the third, I'm in James, the third chapter, verse 2, is my lesson text today. <clears throat> James, uh, James, when he talks in the first 12 verses, uh, 3, he says there, there was a problem. He said, in the church. <clears throat> Here's what James says in the th 12 verses. He says, there's a problem in the pulpit with the sin of the tongue, and there's a problem in the pew with the sin of the tongue. In verse 1, he talks about the problem of the sin of the tongue in the pulpit. And then he goes on and he lays it out to the congregation. <clears throat> he presents a problem. I'm going to present a solution to it, okay? Because we, we've looked at the problem. We've studied it as well as it could be studied, I suppose. And so <clears throat> he comes to verse 2, and that's my text for today, in, in laying the solution, he says, for we all stumble in many ways. Now, what he's going to talk about in the next verses is stumbling with your tongue. Now, let me give you an example of stumbling with your tongue <clears throat> from a pulpit side, uh, from a, a ministerial side. <clears throat> in Matthew, the, the 16th chapter of Matthew, this is a famous story. You, you'll, you'll, you'll remember this. In Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23, Jesus is about to go to the cross, and so he's been, almost all of his Bible studies with his disciples have been preparing them for him going to Jerusalem, being charged with a capital crime, being crucified, being buried, and on the third day being raised from the dead. They're in this conversation once again in Matthew 16. And here's the famous line about it. <laughs> Peter takes Jesus aside and said, listen, you're, you're really getting morbid. I mean, you're, you're talking about going to Jerusalem and being charged with a capital crime and being crucified by Rome, by Gentiles, being buried and raised from the dead, Lord. And they were sitting right on the eve of this. I mean, they're sitting right on, it's going to happen in days. I mean, we're not talking years here. We're talking days, hours and days. <clears throat> and so he takes him aside and he, he rebukes the Lord for the way he's conducting his ministry with him. Huh? 
a sinner tongue. Jesus says to him, listen to me, and this is, a, this is so unusual to come from the mouth of Christ to a disciple. Get behind me, Satan. Remember that? He says to him, get behind me, Satan. Watch this now. You've become a stumbling to me. I've come into the world to go to the cross for the world. It's difficult enough to stay on course without you trying to blow me off course. <clears throat> See, I find it interesting how, he how Jesus addressed him. <clears throat> and he addressed his sin of the tongue. Well, here we are. He says in the second verse, for we all stumble in many ways. And he's talking about the sin of the tongue in context. The sin of the tongue. You know, there are mental attitudes. Listen, three categories of personal sin. Sins of the tongue. Overt sins that most people are aware. And then mental attitude sins. Anger, jealousy, such things as that. How do you know what sin is? Listen to me. How do you know what sin is? You don't come up with your own idea, okay? You don't get a group together and say, this is and this isn't. That's not a fair church conference. The Bible tells you what sin is. You confess what the Bible calls sin. When it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in 1 John 1, 9. <clears throat> you got to know what the sin is that you're confessing. Is now a group of people don't decide that. A church conference doesn't decide that. The guy in the pulpit, unless he's teaching the word of God, doesn't decide that. God decides what sin is. Because it says if you confess your sin, God is faithful to forgive you and cleanse you. <clears throat> so that's very important. That's very important. I mean, how do you know what sin is? If you don't study the Bible, you'll never know it. You're like, if you go to the book of Romans and study the first five chapters, you will get that picture. You know, most people are lazy. They don't want to read any passages out of the Bible. But at least that would be a, a place to start. Uh, it is the word of God that teaches you what sin is. Well, here we are in the third chapter. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble. Now, watch what he says here. And he's talking about the sin of the tongue. <clears throat> and we, listen, we've done a lot of study on this. So if you're new just go to our archives, and if you're interested, you can pull down a lot of studies. Right. I didn't recognize the voice. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, kind of like what I said with Peter, He's a perfect man. What is that? That's teleos in the Greek language. Now I'm going to come to a word of prayer. I'm just reading it now. I'm just reading it and giving you a dialogue with it. The word perfect here is teleos in the Greek language. It doesn't mean perfect in the way you might think. It means mature. Spiritually mature. The book of Philippians deals with this word a great deal. Paul does. We, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, sin of the tongue, he is a mature man, a mature believer, a spiritually mature believer. We say, how do you become that? Well, listen, here's how you become that. Every person that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. That's the gospel. When you believe it, you get saved. <clears throat> you know what? In the spiritual kingdom, you're saved as <clears throat> a baby. When you get born again or regenerated, I don't care if you're 80 years old, you're a baby believer. 1 Peter 2.2. 1 Peter 2.2. And what does that newborn baby desire? 
a natural desire spiritually. Hmm? The milk of the word of God. <clears throat> that baby has got to grow up and he, he reaches a stage that breathos is the word for baby, breathos. He grows up to an apios stage, which is an immature, and an immature believer is a natural stage, like, a, like teenagers. They reach, that's an immature part. They're not a child, and they're not adult. They're immature. You should act, they, they act that way, and you should expect it. <clears throat> okay? They're immature. They're not a baby anymore, <clears throat> but they're not an adult taking responsibility, making wise decisions, and all that thing. That's an apios, an apios. He's no longer a baby, but he's not a mature, responsible person. And uh, that can be a long period in there. <laughs> they all can be a long period. How do, if he stays growing, how do you grow from a baby to an immature believer? Word of God. Word of God. First, first Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. And then you go through milk doctrines. Babies want milk. Here's a passage for you. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, 13.14. It says it there. If you're interested in where your life is, listen, where your life is, you're either a baby believer, if you believe the gospel, you're either, today, you're either a baby believer today, doesn't matter how long you've been saved, it's whether or not you've grown while saved. You could be 20 years in Christianity and still be a baby believer, insecure in your salvation. Don't know from one day to the other whether, you're, whether you'll lose it. You can't lose it, it's grace. Doesn't, it's not based on your character. Your salvation is not based on your character nor your work. For by grace you were saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God, not of works. <clears throat> then you grow in the word of God. Babies got to have milk. Immature has to have milk and meat. When you come up, they st still need quite a bit of milk <clears throat> and working now meat diet in there. And this is the Christian way of life. Doctrines that deal with the Christian way of life. A mature person, wow, this is what you're after. This is what he's talking about here. A mature person is able, is able to do what he's talking about here, is able to make good, wise, spiritually adult decisions in their life that's good for them and their relationship with God. You can find that in Hebrews, Hebrews, the fifth chapter, 13 and 14. The difference between melt. See, People go to church, they, they've never heard that there was a difference in spiritual growth momentum in your life between milk and meat. They have no idea. When I talk about milk and meat, people don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And yet it's all over the New Covenant thinking. <laughs> Let's, have <a> word <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer and let me get into my study. I've just introduced you to the text. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. <laughs> Listen to the Bible. You got your Bible with you? You got your Bible with you? Look up here. You got your Bible with you? I, I know some of you got a phone. I'm okay with that. I've learned to accept that. <laughs> okay? That's been hard, but I accept that. Listen, put your hand on your Bible. Put your hand on the Bible. If you ain't got one, there's one in the pew. Reach over. Put your hand on the Bible. And say, say in your head. I don't want to hear it out loud. Just say it in your head. This is a spiritual book for spiritual people. For spiritual living. Can you say amen? Is that not true? <laughs> We're in trouble if it's not. That's all we got. Now, now listen to me. Evidence of, you're either carnal or spiritual. First, First Corinthians 3rd chapter, either, either, either you're carnal or spiritual. Either you're walking in the spirit or you're walking by the flesh. If you're walking by the flesh, then that produces sin. Walking in the flesh. James 1, 14 and 15, that's how, how it works. Gratification, gratification of the lust of the flesh, 
gratification is what personal sin is after. And when he gets it, then it sins. James 1, 14, 15. <clears throat> Evidence of carnality. Now listen to me. Either you're spiritual or carnal. Evidence of carnality. Listen, a Bible study. Spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It's the evidence in your soul. And, and you know who's going to make that evident in your soul? The Holy Spirit who has been quenched and grieved. When you sinned and didn't confess, it grieves him and quenches his work. You're called carnal. 1 John 1, 9 addresses that problem. If we confess our sin, personal sin, it could be sin of the tongue, it could be mental attitude sin, or it could be overt sin. But when he points it out, and you know it by the word of God, you're to confess it. Homo legeo, you're to name it and cite it as in agreement with God who calls it sin. You understand homo legeo? That was the word confess in the Greek language. It's important you understand what God means by that. And listen, when you confess it, and that's a third-class condition, if, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but if you do, here's what God's promised. <clears throat> the evidence of carnality is personal sin. Here's what God promised. If you will confess your sin, come into agreement with God that that is sin, and it is in your life. Now, are you with me? Please tell me, you, at least you're hearing me. All right, give me that. When you confess that sin, here's what he promised you. That the work of Christ, that's your salvation, that you believe to be saved, that blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that washes away my sin, right? Come on, that old hymn. We all sang that old hymn, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the what? Blood. Nothing but the blood. Listen, you got enough southern gospel in you, haven't you? Just sing that song. Come on. <clears throat> When you confess your sin, come into agreement with God that that is sin and that sin is in your life. Are you with me? Well, if you get nothing else from this study today, at least get the introduction. <laughs> so what do I do? I confess it. I come into agreement with God that that's sin and that sin is in my life. Agreed? I confess that to him. Here's what he promises. I will forgive it and I will cleanse it. I will forgive it. I will cleanse it based on the work of Christ on the cross. It's always the blood. Nothing but the blood can cleanse you from sin. Nothing. You can sit and whine and cry and, oh, how did I do it? And get all... <laughs> Nothing. If you want to emote, that's your business. It won't, that's not God's business. Emoting is not God's business. Confession brings forgiveness and cleansing. The work of Christ on the cross is extended to the Christian life. When he confesses his sin, he moves from carnality back to spirituality by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in his life. Agreed? Yes. Did you not know that the moment you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, God did, the Holy Spirit did seven works that are, 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 can never be changed in time and eternity? One of those eight works of the Holy Spirit, because you live in the new covenant. One of those eight works was to indwell your body, and your body, listen to me, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, and your body became the what? Temple. temple of God. The word in the Greek language is naos. The naos was the inner sanctuary in the tabernacle where the blood was on atonement. It's where you met God. At your body in the new covenant, in the new covenant, you are the sanctuary of God. Have I had prayer? <laughs> I may never get to prayer if I just don't stop doing it. Well, that's what this is all about. Will you confess your sin? Uh, and let me get back to my lesson, okay? Let's just get this thing out of the way. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Agreed? Let's just do business and let me preach. All right, let, let me get on with my lesson. I give you a moment in your priesthood. Every believer is a priest. 
part of the 20 status privileges under the new covenant to every church age believer in the package of salvation of 50 things. Oh, Father, we're so thankful. When, when Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, oh, God, I want to tell you, I hope for this. I pray and I preach to the end that others would come to this kind of truth that I'm speaking about today that can just release you from the bondage of the penalty of sin and the power of sin in our life because of the grace of God. Encourage our hearts today, Father, with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, where was I before I prayed? Anybody have an idea? All right, well, let's just move on. Point one. I'm at point one. Point one. Hey, look up there in the second paragraph. In our lesson text, James says that the key to bridling the whole body, look, let me go back and read that. If he's a, it does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature, spiritual, mature believer, able to bridle, able to bridle the whole body as well. Listen, if you learn what I did in my introduction, if you can learn to identify carnality by the evidence of personal sin as described by God in the Word of God, and if you will, 1 John 1, 9, confess that sin, He is faithful and just to restore you to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you. You don't have to get saved again. You've got to become spiritual again. You got to get back with the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You want to be a spiritual person? The word in spirituality is the word spirit, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so he said, if you can learn to conquer, for example, if you can learn how to deal with the sin of the tongue, then you can you know how to deal with the mental attitude sins and and overt sins. In other words, this is how you deal with sin over the big perspective. This is a solution to all sin in the Christian life. <clears throat> now, this will be on our web. You go to doctrinalstudies.com and uh, sometime this week, probably, <clears throat> and William says, that when you hear a message like this, and I haven't even talked about I just I've given you a message today. William says you've got to hear it ten times to get it. <clears throat> now, not ten times to hear it, ten times to get it. So if you're really interested in this subject and you haven't been able to take notes well enough, you can go back into our archives and pick this study up either by the date. Uh, the day or the subject, and uh, sit down and learn. Hear this ten times because you really need to get this one. All right. So James says that learning to bridle the whole body is reaching and maintaining spiritual maturity, being a perfect man, <clears throat> person. <clears throat> now, James point one. James is showing that the same application of spiritual maturity. In bridling, the sin of the tongue works for all personal sins. That's what he means by bridle the whole body. <clears throat> what, if you learn to bridle your tongue, you can learn to bridle. How do you bridle the tongue? Well, if it's already guilty of the sin of the tongue, you confess it and it puts back in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's Galatians 5, 16, 17. Uh, I tell you, if you will learn what I'm telling you today, it will revolutionize your Christian life. This is the message the church is not hearing today and is missing. This will revolutionize your life. When I heard this message 100 years ago, it set my world on fire. Because I thought being spiritual was what you did, not what you believed. <clears throat> it set my world on fire. 
In James 3, 2, he shows how important reaching and maintaining spiritual growth maturity is to dealing with all personal sin, whether it be mental attitude sins, the sense of the tongue, overt sins, such. And, and I laid that back out to you. You know what you should pay attention to? See that I, I wrote out James 3, 2? You should see that there's two parts to that. Watch, what, watch the first part and the second part. Now pay attention to me. Watch the first part. The first part is, for we all stumble in many ways. We're not mature. We're a baby believer, and we stumble all over other things because we don't have the maturity to recognize what it is. We're a baby. <clears throat> then we get into immaturity. We have the same problem. As we're now taken off milk and put on meat, which introduces, introduces us to a whole new world of activities in our life spiritually, right? Like a teenager, uh, a, mid, a middle schooler who decides he wants to be in the band, play some football, basketball, yada, yada, and decides, like I did in the sixth grade, that I wanted college education because of a wonderful teacher I had, just a wonderful teacher, and never turned me loose of that idea that I could go to college. I went home excited telling my parents. They said, mm, can't do that, son. That's a, that's a great goal, but we can't afford to send you to college. I went back to school depressed and told her that. And she said, you can send yourself, but you got to be a better student than you are. Right now, you're an average C student. And she told me sixth grade, if you'll work and bring that up to a strong B and an A student, I'll show you how to do this. Ron Adema, you can send yourself to college. And listen, Phyllis Breen couldn't have been, she hit that thing right on the nail, and I did it. <clears throat> I didn't get no loans. I didn't do any of that stuff. <clears throat> I, let, I, I let my brain do it. And I was just an average old <clears throat> mediocre C student and comfortable with it until Phyllis Brini got me in the sixth grade and set my world on fire educationally. <clears throat> and she walked me through that whole thing through high school, walked me through that whole thing with colleges and everything. What a wonderful teacher. What a wonderful teacher. What a wonderful teacher. Well, in the first part of this, if we all stumble in many ways. Boom, that's one. Then he introduces an if, which is a first-class condition. That means if it's true in the if part, it's true in the then part. In the Greek language, you have four ifs. In the English, English you have one, and you really got to pay attention because you don't know what they're talking about. But in the Greek, they spelled it out. So there's the second part. It says, if... Anyone does not stumble in what he says. If that's true, then this is true. He is a mature man and able to bridle his whole body. I mean, he started out in life, uh, didn't even know he had a whole body. <laughs> then he learned that that was his foot and that was his hand. And he sh the natural place for the baby was to put his foot in his mouth. But we would like him to change by the time he comes uh, 50 years old, we would like to see him not put his foot in his mouth anymore. And then when you get to be 60 or 70, you can't anyhow, so it don't matter. <laughs> Other people do, but you can't do it yourself. So that's a first-class condition that's very important to your study. The second point, every church-age believer, that's cab for us, that's church-age believer, is equipped at salvation. Listen to me. This, again, this is not taught. And it just drives me nuts. It's taught here, though. We call it the grace operating assets of the Lord. Grace operating assets or goal. The goal. You know what? You're, listen, your goal is you're born to believe. In the eyes of God, here's how God keeps up with you. You're either a baby or an immature or a mature spiritual person. If you're mature, God sees you that way and deals with you that way. Don't parents? Huh? Look, if you have a 
40-year-old child today that's got a couple kids. You deal with that different than you did when she was five going to school for the first time. I guess. I don't know. Grace operating assets. Listen, here's part of this idea. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. We wrote a pamphlet on this idea. 50 things you can never lose in time and eternity that you get at salvation. Every believer gets it. I don't know. There may be some back there. <clears throat> on your way out, you can pick up one. If not, they're on our website. Print it down. As long as you don't sell it, we ha you can print as many as you want. We don't care. Just don't sell it. Um, let, me, let me explain. Let, I want to show you seven aspects of gold. Grace operating assets of the Lord. <clears throat> Let me show you these things. You don't even pay attention to them, and you should, because these are things that you should praise God over. These are the things, grace operating assets is some of the things you should every day thank God. You don't have to go through the whole list, but every day, and listen, if you're a spiritual mature people, these are the things you thank him for every day. Listen to what some of them are. A completed canon of Scripture. Do you know how privileged we are to have a completed Bible? We live in the new covenant in the last days. And we have a completed canon. It's a completed canon because we're new covenant. We have an old covenant. We have a new covenant. We have an Old Testament and New Testament. But the reason that God completed that thing and it's part of our ministry in our day, which is phenomenal, because we live in the last days. You know, when you take part in the Eucharist, Lord's Supper, whatever you call it, communion, we call it Eucharist. Because it, the w Greek word means giving thanks. Do you know why you take, you know, you take part in it? And you say, you proclaim the Lord's death you take the Eucharist, you proclaim the Lord's death until he what? Comes. Until he comes. <clears throat> but seven things that you should be aware of, that you should be thankful for, is a completed canon of Scripture. <clears throat> I've given you Scriptures connected with it. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be spiritual apart from the Holy Spirit. You're not spiritual because you do, do religious things. <laughs> it's called spirituality because it requires the Holy Spirit, the third member of the God. Listen to me. The, th the third member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead lives inside your body. And your body is no longer your own. It was purchased the moment you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was purchased. And your body at that moment became the temple of God, whether you knew it or didn't know it. You know it because the Bible says it in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And your body is no longer your own. And that's a good thing because when you die, that body you've got, that's called the temple, will go to the d dust of ashes and you will be given a new one at the second coming of Christ. Whoa. But between your salvation and the second coming of Christ, your body ought to be the temple of God as such it is. Your body is not your own. It's been bought. It is a mobile church ministry. Your body, wherever it goes, it carries the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, where spirituality takes place. It is the church where spirituality takes place no matter where that body is. Are you that person? Are you that person? I, I look, I'm not prying. It's none of my business. My business is to tell you the truth, the truth of what sets you free, not me. <clears throat> You've got to learn how to be set free from this cosmic system. 
why you've been saved. What purpose is your life? What purpose is your life? In the kingdom. In the kingdom of God. Not what is the purpose of your life in the world. But rather, what is it in the kingdom of God? Joseph, we're studying that on Tuesday night out in uh, Moody at Meadows, Meadows Lane, 10, 1047 Meadows Lane, Tuesday night, 630. Come out and study with us the life of Joseph. Listen, he had a, he had a life in Egypt. That's not where his life was. His life was in the kingdom of God. His life was in the kingdom of God. And when God sent him to Egypt, he sent the kingdom of God to Egypt. Wherever he sends you, wherever your body goes, the kingdom's dynamic is there. The grace operating assets are ready to be used and, and manifested. Membership in the body of Christ. You know, every person is a member of the body, is a member of the church the moment he gets saved. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. And the Holy Spirit at the same time baptizes you into the body of Christ, the church. If people go like, well, I, I don't belong to any church. You do if you're saved. <laughs> Listen, it is for the church that Jesus Christ comes back. Right? Uh, some of those who have died and are with Christ will come with him, and those of us who remain and are alive at his coming will be caught up together with them, and evermore shall we be. Who are? You might as well face the absolute truth and let it set you free. The moment you got saved, you become a member of the church, the body of Christ. And he is the head. Ron Adam is not the head of his church. I am not the head of this church. It is my spiritual gift that works. I have the gift of Pastor T. That's the gift. <clears throat> not the head of the church. The Board of Deacons is not the head of the church. All the membership in here and one vote is not the head of the church. The head of the church, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the head of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. The guy who dies on a cross is buried on the day, raised on the third day is the guy who's head of the church. And that's not me. That's nobody but the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an awesome you see, he used an illustration about can bridle the whole body. The rider who is on an enormous, powerful horse can control our horse with a bridle with a bit. That bit in that mouth puts that driver in control of that big horse, and he can control the whole body with that little bit. Right? James says that in the third verse. Every church-age believer is equipped. Membership. As every, every believer in the church, here's goal, grace operating asset. At the moment of salvation, you were given a spiritual gift. It works in the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12. You have an eye. Your eye is not for the eye, it's for the body. You have an ear. The ear is not for the ear, it's for the body. You have a hand. The hand is not, this is how Paul talks about spiritual gifts. And everybody has one. And it's not yours. It's on loan. It's what makes your identity in the body of Christ, the local church, is what gives your life meaning and purpose to the church. You have a gifted ministry. Do you not know that? There's no such thing as ungifted church age believers. Everyone is given a gift. You need to read the Bible, people. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Oh, it's a powerful chapter. <clears throat> So there, there are spiritually gifted ministries in the church. Listen, here's one. Every believer has access to the throne of God's grace. Do you know how powerful, that, that, that Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, you know what, how, what a powerful idea that is? 
this powerful idea, access to the throne of God's grace. It's called the throne of God's grace. You should never lack grace operating in your life. You have access to the throne of grace every moment of every day of your entire life. You know why? Jesus Christ. Listen, you know what I love about the throne of grace? I'm not going to get through my lesson anyhow. <laughs> so let's, just, let's just sit back and talk a little bit. <clears throat> we'll take an offering in a moment. And we'll go get a cup of coffee and have a donut. Will that be all right? <laughs> it's just like home, isn't it? You know what I like about the th access to the throne of grace? Listen, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know why I have access to the throne of grace? Because God is my daddy. God's my daddy. He's not just my God, and he's not just my father. He's my daddy. He's my Abba Pater, Romans 8th chapter, uh, Galatians 4. You know what I like about it? I, I like this about it. And this is what I, I love. Spiritual maturity helps me understand <clears throat> the privilege it is to have access. Now, think about that the privilege to have access to God Almighty any time of the day for any reason. Because you know why? He's your daddy. He's your daddy. Romans 8 and Galatians 4. Now, listen. Sometimes it's a 911 call. I hit the throne, boom. <laughs> right? On my knees, on my face. And I throw up a 911. Not one time under any condition will he not pick the phone up and say, Is that you, Ronnie? Yeah, you know, that's the way he talks to you because he's your daddy. He gave birth to you. He's your daddy. And I love that. I love that about God. I love it. I go like, oh, God. Here I am again. I know. I know, Ronnie. But do you know I, I haven't left you? Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You do know that. I've ne you know that I've, I've never left you. You do know that, don't you? Ronnie, do you not know that? See, I love to have that confidence on the worst day of my life when I throw up a 911. That don't get somebody on the other line that goes like, uh, he's not speaking to you right now. He's a little ill with you. He doesn't do that. Because... It's the throne of grace, not works. It's based on the character of God who sits on the throne, not on you who are at the foot of it. I love that about him. I love that about God. The other thing I love about God is that he'll take my call just when I want chat. I love that. <clears throat> my son Billy comes over to my home. Every chance he can get on Thursdays, Spend time with mom and dad. I can't begin to tell you the wonderful impact that is upon my life. I'm coming over, dad. Let's just go out and have a cup of coffee and chat a little bit. I love that. I know God loves it. I love, I love it because I know God loves it. It's not one of those 911 deals. It's just, hey, let's, I want, just, let's come over. I just want to come over and chat and let's sit and talk. And I love that about God. You, you, he can do that with him. You don't, you know, you can do it in your 90s or dressed up or your comfort zones, clothes and all that. Let's just have a talk. And he's always there. 
Just talk to me. I love that about God, and I love that about his throne. I love that. Another one of the grace operating assets is that you have the ability to be a part of a local church with a pastor teacher that knows how to take you to spiritual growth maturity. Makes no bones about it. I absolutely know how to do this. <clears throat> you come and spend one year with me. Come spend one year with me. Pick out whatever day you can come. Come as many days as you want. I teach on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. <clears throat> but pick out one that you can stay regular with me to go through different series and subject matters with me. I promise you, your life will never be the same. Never. Never. But you got to make an investment with me in it. I've got to be able to take you on this journey of growth. I've got to be able to take you from milk to meat and into the responsibilities of, a, of what it means to be an adult. My final point of the seven goal is victory in the angelic conflict. And a lot of people don't know there is an angelic conflict. It would serve you well to know all about it. I love 1 John 5, 4. This is a victory. Listen to me. Boy, you, be, you ought to get this verse down. This is, this, this is the victory that overcomes the world. Think about that. I mean, which one, any one of us that wants to say, well, I think today I'll just go out and conquer the whole world. <clears throat> and somebody asks you, you mean the whole world like all the continents? Because we don't think they mean that, do we? When it says, I just need, we think he's talking about his little, his little space, whatever his address at his house is or something. This means the world. This means the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. You tell me that you can't solve your marital problems, you tell me you can't solve your financial problems, you tell me you can't solve whatever problems that is in your life, your world has shrunk because your faith has. You really need to understand the faith cycle. You need to understand the faith cycle. Now I got time to teach it today. You need to understand the faith cycle. This is what he's talking about here. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. He's talking about how to access that faith so they can do that. 